record this. Um, cool, so I hope you can see my screen okay. I was trying to figure out a way that I could screen present and do my presenter notes at the same time and I think I've got it. Hopefully um, you guys can't see my notes because that would be really embarrassing. Um, cool, all right, so here we are. <laughs> this is my first of these kind of presentations. Um, and you may be wondering like why the hell I'm doing a recycling presentation and how I got to this point in my life that I'm spending my Thursday evenings just wanting to talk about recycling. Um, so <laughs> I am doing this because I got involved um, in this kind of stuff about nine months ago. I watched a documentary called The Story of Plastic and it scared the shit out of me. And I just was really terrified about the way things are going. I learned a lot about the upstream impacts of um, what plastic production is doing to the livelihoods of a lot of people around the world, particularly in developing countries, but also learn a lot about where plastic ends up and all the pollution that's happening through our oceans, not with just like large scale um, pieces of plastic and trash, but also the microplastics as well, which is something we don't see, but is, yeah, it's becoming more and more evident as to be a huge problem. So that's how kind of how I started and it's just really spiraled into this whole environmental thing and now I'm in part of a climate group and I'm just like looking at you know I don't think there's anyone here for my work but looking at changing roles to you know potentially build this stuff into like advocacy and activism into my um, 40 hours a week as well so who knows where this is going but this is kind of one of the um, first steps for me of speaking out I suppose and trying to more actively educate others and um, so and then how I kind of got more into the recycling side of everything was that I went to um, a recycling centre open day at the Christchurch Recycling Depot. Um, that's me just having the friggin' time of my life <laughs> learning. <laughs> um, but it was a really interesting visit for me. I got to talk to people from all aspects of the recycling process at this plant and learn a lot more about what happens to plastics after we chuck it in that well, in Christchurch, it's the yellow bin. I think in Australia, it's the yellow bin. Uh, yeah, what, what happens after you chuck it in the bin? So another reason I wanted to do this webinar is with all the things I've learned, like recycling is just bloody confusing. Like you can do this, but you can't do that. And that number's okay, but that's not. If you're in Christchurch, you do this. If you're in Auckland, then you do this. Who bloody knows what happens in Australia? Like, I don't know. So the rules are really different depending on where you are. It doesn't help that they change all the flipping time. So I think it's really reasonable that people are confused and I don't really blame anyone for not having a really clear view of the time. But I suppose what I'm going to do tonight is focus on the things that I know from the Christchurch City Council, but hopefully some stuff will be able to be transferable through to you guys. So I just also want to start with a disclaimer of I'm not perfect. I'm definitely not any kind of recycling um, goddess. Like I just don't I'm not 100% sure of everything. So I'm not perfect. I've got a pretty good clue. But if there's anyone on the call who's like, that's not right, just tell me maybe in private or something so I don't get too embarrassed. <laughs> um, but because I do need to learn as well, I don't know everything. But I'm just trying to put progress over perfection and just chip away at things a little bit at a time. Uh, so tonight I'm going to be going through, yeah, first I thought I'd kick off by actually explaining a bit more about what the recycling process is, um, how things are treated, the different aspects of the process that you go through, um, then doing a quick one about how to recycle uh, correctly, keeping in mind that I am in Christchurch and different places, wherever you guys are, wherever your council is, is going to be different. Even within Melbourne, if you're in Burundara, it treats it differently to I don't know what another council is, Stonington. Um, and then jumping into why recycling is important and then why I think there's some better solutions out there to just recycling. And then lastly, we'll do some question time. So again, I just wanted to highlight again that this is largely Christchurch based. Um, so if I say you can only recycle this code and this code, it's not necessarily the case for your council because yeah, I'm over here in tiny little Christchurch um, on the map there. Okay, so hopefully so far so good. Um, so bear with me, I'm going to go through what happens to your trash after you put it in the recycling bin, what, like, what process it goes through before it gets spat out the other end. So I think a lot of people think they can, when they're used, they're finished with a product, they can just throw it away. 
And I really want to enforce that there is no way. <laughs> There's no like little fairy that takes away the, the rubbish and it's just like poof gone. Like, and I want to just drill home that we all have a responsibility to know where things are going, how it's being treated, how it got there in the first place. And anybody who could be, um, I guess, implicated is not the right word, but impacted along that journey. So I've kind of broken uh, everything down into a couple of steps. So I think I've done six phases in the end. So phase one is from when you put your bin out on the curb, uh, on the nature strip or the verge, depending on wherever you're living. And uh, the bin man comes and picks it up. That's transported back to the depot, wherever the recycling center is within your council. So for Christchurch, I learned that uh, that all goes back to just the one depot. So I think there's a couple of Christchurch. So Shay and Shar, if you come back to Christchurch, <laughs> um, that is the one out, uh, where is it? Is it? It's in Wigram, I think, somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, so I live in Sumner, which for the others is about maybe 25 minutes, half or an hour away from there. So every time the truck will come and pick something up from my house, it'll probably have the capacity in its little dumpster bit to pick up all the bins from Sumner, but then has to drive half an hour back to Wigram to then dump that rubbish into the, the recycling center to then go back out. So there's a lot of, I suppose I didn't really think about the fact that the trucks probably spend a whole bunch of their time just traveling back and forward, not just collecting the actual bins as well and how, much, how many emissions and stuff that must release as well. It's something I just never really thought about too much. Um, yeah, so once the truck's picked up your bin, the contents of your bin and tipped it in, the bin truck then comes to back to the centre. But on the way, um, I learned <laughs> I learned a few things <laughs> about what happens. So turns out that um, in Christchurch, and I got this from talking to people at the Recycling Centre Open Day, but I didn't know this. I, this hadn't been something I found online. I, I was talking to a guy and he was one of the bin truck drivers and he was like, oh yeah, had a fire this week. And I was like, what do you mean a <laughs> fire? And he said that, yeah, between four and five bin trucks catch on fire every year in Christchurch alone. And Christchurch is a pretty small place. Um, there's only like 400,000 people here. So if you imagine something the scale of Melbourne where there's 5 million people timesing the amount of bin trucks there by maths, like over 10, you're probably going to have 10 times the amount of bin truck fires if people are on the same level of contaminating stuff so he said it's things like gas bottles it's things like batteries there's an arm within the there's like a compactor within the bin truck and it will crush the gas bottles causing explosions or things like that they catch on fire and they burn and sometimes it's the whole truck sometimes it's just part of the truck but imagine the taxpayer money having to pay to replace those trucks it's just insane so if anything else um, the money that it costs you as a taxpayer to replace those bin trucks is enough motivation to make sure um, this kind of thing doesn't happen. I also found out that out of all the recycling trucks that get, um, get taken to the Christchurch Recycling Centre, 40% of them actually have to just be diverted immediately to landfill because of the contamination. So once stuff's dumped onto the floor, it goes through a visual contamination check. So they'll have a look they'll see if there's stuff that's clearly contaminated, they'll just pick it up again and they'll send it straight to landfill. So 40%, which I thought was crazy. Um, and that's at a cost of $1,000 per truck. So yeah, that's a whole lot of stuff going straight to landfill. Um, the kind of things that could contaminate it, apparently a lot of pooey nappies go in the recycling bin. And if you can imagine that just exploding over everything as the <laughs> Shay's showing me his babies. <laughs> no dirty nappies. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. Um, uh, yeah, so just, and other things are maybe like a, a half use bottle of motor oil. If someone goes, oh, this is a plastic container and just chucks in the recycling. Now you've got motor oil over all of the contents of the recycling bin. So you might be an absolutely like gold star, 100% awesome recycler but if your neighbor's a shithead and putting motor oil in his recycling bin your stuff's going in the same truck all of your stuff all of your good work it only takes one person in your whole suburb really to mess up the whole thing so it's yeah it's hugely frustrating <laughs> but that's just the way it is 
Okay, I'm going to push along phase two. Um, so what I didn't realize as well as part of the recycling process is there's real people, real people are sorting the rubbish that comes in. So it goes up from the floor of the recycling center. It goes up a conveyor, but this isn't crash it. it goes up a conveyor belt and goes through what they call like a contamination room. So there'll be like half a dozen people in there who have to like actually stuff comes along. They'll pick out bits and pieces that aren't that don't belong, that aren't recyclable and chuck it into a chute. Um, so firstly, imagine that job. Like, oh, yeah, I just think that's horrible enough already. Um, but then just like imagine the things that they've seen as they're going through this stuff. People are just really crappy recyclers. And um, yeah, when I was at the recycling center open day, I chatted to one of the guys who works in the contamination room. And I was like, what's the, the biggest, what's the biggest thing that people are doing wrong? at the moment like what what's the number one thing if you could get people to stop it and he said shitty nappies and he also um one of the most shocking things from that interaction with me was he said lately we've been getting a lot of animal carcasses and I was just like ooh, like rats and possums and he's like bigger and I'm like like dogs and cats he's like bigger I'm like oh like sheep and he's like, yeah, try goats and boars and like people have been hunting and just dropped stuff thinking maybe this can be recycled or just not thought about it. So it's just, yeah, it's just pretty grotty. I'm not, I don't think any of you guys would do that kind of thing, but um, yeah, pretty heinous. Um, so yeah, this was a sheet that I found when I was at the recycling center of the most common contaminants. So yeah, food waste, chemicals, um, these are the, some of the grosser ones that I found. Dialysis bag. Um, uh, yeah, disposable nappies, syringes, um, which, you know, people shouldn't have to manually sort through that with their hands. Um, cool. So this is a picture that I took while I was there. Don't know if you can read that on your screen, but the little sign on the right-hand side says, this is one hour of waste removed by hand of contaminants from what's coming through. And I thought Cantabrians were pretty good recyclers, but this really made me lose a little bit of faith. <laughs> okay, so phase three is some more screening stations. So these are um, mechanical or automated um, screening stations. Uh, so they kind of work through, I don't know, like the graphics probably a little bit small, not very clear, but this is the best I could get. But from what I understand um, is there's a series of screens. So something like in the... I think they're like a series of spinning discs most of the time. So for the cardboard, it will make it so anything, assume any paper, any cardboard is quite light. So they'll get that and it'll run over the top of these rollers or these discs so that um, the paper travels up and over stuff and while everything else falls between because it's heavier. So that kind of stuff um, will drop down into a particular area. So the cardboard and the paper is already sorted out. And then when you move along, um, the next section I think is glass. So I think by this point they've crushed the glass or like smashed the glass. So the glass is quite heavy and then small and then it'll fall through the gaps. So the glass comes out. And then I think next is um, in Christchurch is a magnet. So that's used to um, pull up all the tin, all of the metal out of the, the whole bunch of everything. And then lastly, you're left with the plastics and this one's pretty cool. Um, so from what I understand, they use optical laser beams to um, identify. So I think it's infrared light and if they shine it through each piece of plastic it then identifies and the computer finds out if it's one of three plastics and then they use like a jet of air to then direct that piece of plastic as it's coming through into one of the three slots, which is quite cool. So that's how they, um, I don't know what the different plastics are. I'm not quite there yet, but like the PET, you know, this and the P something, something there. And yeah, anyway, the directional jet of air seems to put them into all these different holding bins. So that was quite, that was quite cool. I, yeah. And it seems to do it with quite a degree of accuracy, which was really impressive. Uh, but one thing that is quite disappointing, so when it comes to contaminants as well, um, it leads to often some big downtime on those machines. So there's a lot, there's a lot happening between all of those screening processes. A lot of like discs moving in action together or a lot of chain pulleys, that type of thing. 
and there's a few things that they highlighted that cause really big downtime for the machine. So something like a chain from a bike or from some other kind of something that uses a chain, chainsaw, um, could jam the machine and cause downtime. So while they're fixing that, say it takes 75 minutes to remove that and then get things back up and running, that downtime costs, um, guess what, taxpayers, $3,200 for one person putting a chain in there. Same metal bar, steel bracket, even a lanyard. It was like a business lanyard. So tiny, tiny little lanyard um, got hooked through a hole in one of the big cogs and yeah, put shut the machine down for 90 minutes, which cost nearly four grand. And then they had to replace the most broken machine part, which cost nearly a grand as well. So yeah, all of this kind of stuff, very preventable. But I can see where people are getting confused. They're like, well, metal's recyclable. I can pop this bit of metal in there. But yeah, there are parameters in place so that these kind of things don't happen. So that's why it's really important to know what you can and you can't do. Sorry, just one person joining. Um, cool. And then phase four is um, bailing up the recycling so this was quite cool they use um like a compactor of sorts i guess to squash all of the materials that they've sorted into larger bales so just like baling hay chucking the baling <laughs> baling together like that um so these are the some of the bales that i saw while i was there um, these are my own photos so you've got on the right hand side um, a bale that's made of aluminium cans um, and then on the left one, left top is cardboard and bottom left is milk bottles or like plastic, clearish plastic. So yeah, when those bales have been put together of those sorted um, materials, they get put into a really big shipping container. And then I think, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think they um, get transported to another location and that's where um, brokers come in and brokers will come in and so page number five brokers inspect and hopefully purchase the bales so in this process the brokers i suppose just to really spell it out the brokers are someone who acts between i suppose um the people trying to sell the bales and then the people trying to buy the bales at the very end, usually in countries like India, um, I think Bangladesh, China, that type of thing. Uh, so these brokers are representatives in New Zealand who um, inspect the bales um, because they are essentially, once they're turned into these bales, they're sold as commodities in an open market. So the brokers will come in and, and pitch a price so from what I understand, Christchurch actually retains the glass. Um, glass, obviously, a little bit harder to bail. <laughs> um, so Christchurch retains the glass and processes it here. But from what I understand, most other things are actually um, purchased and sent offshore. So when a baler is inspecting this product, they'll often open them up like you can see in that photo and have a look through. What they're looking for is contaminants. Um, so if you have food waste through there, if you have... Um, maybe some plastic in the paper section or vice versa, those make them a lot less desirable for somebody purchasing the bales. Um, obviously, it's going to become their problem to then remove the contaminants. So it's easier for them to just say, yeah, nah, thanks, nah. Um, so this is where things like the problem, do you guys remember that a little while ago there was this big hoo-ha and everyone was like, oh, bloody China not taking out rubbish. That's our fault. That's not their fault. <laughs> this, this recycling, this rubbish is our problem. It's not their problem. And the reason that they refused buying our trash in the end was because the level of contaminants became too high for them to make it worthwhile for them to sell. And also the supply of trash these days well outstrips the demand for it. There's only so much they can do with it. And we're just simply churning through stuff way quicker than I think that we should be. Um... Yeah, so anything that's considered too low grade by a broker or by a recycler, like if it's really bad, um, the whole bale ends up going to landfill. So not only do we have landfill, oh, stuff being diverted to landfill right at the very start of the process, but yeah, it's even at the baling process, there's still things that are deemed to be too contaminated to be sold. Um, and yeah, they go to landfill, which is a real, 
a real shame. <laughs> um, I feel like I was going to say one more thing on bailing. Oh, it's gone. Uh, cool. So phase six is, I didn't, I couldn't think of a clever word. So I've gone with remanufacturing. Um, so this is where, um, so this is just an example I've used in plastic, but what happens is the bottles will be, oh, I don't remember what I was going to say, back up. So there's some types of plastic, for example, that are more desirable to brokers. So something what I recently learned is clear plastic. So like clear milk bottles or like a clear water bottle, like a pump bottle is much more desirable to them than something that's already been dyed and colored. So for example, I'm just like that person in the office now that's just real a real pest. Um, but I recently then asked our um, kind of office manager if she could please start buying clear plastic milk bottles instead of buying ones that are dyed white because to a yeah to a broker or to someone buying these recycled bundles buying one that's got clear plastic um, is much provides a lot more flexibility for them so it means that if they want to then make it blue it's a lot easier to make it blue than from clear than it would be from white or from pink <laughs> moving on uh yeah so with the remanufacturing process it's um changing the format of what's yeah what's happening to everything so this is just an exam and i'm not exactly sure that this is this, the right process the correct process that i've found here but it looks like things are kind of chipped down from what i understand there things are cleaned then they're chipped down they sometimes turn into like stringy fibers if the plastic's then being put into stuff like clothing like polyester um otherwise it's often made into these little pellets which you can see there um, on that um, the plastic picture and then those things can then be so these are this process usually happens offshore but then those pellets can be sold back to somewhere like Australia or somewhere like New Zealand so that when Coke's making their new bottles they can just melt down from the pellets and then with the glass um, I know in Christchurch the glass is crushed on site and then recycled within New Zealand to then be turned into bottles and jars and things like that or Otherwise, if it's um, too colourful, they can use it as what they call like glass crete. So it's like a concrete but made out of glass or they can use it for building roads or filling, filling certain things like roads. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the phase one to six of the process of everything. Um, but I do want to now move on to, and well, I kind of wanted to go through that first because I feel like the next step of the thing I wanted to talk about was how to recycle co correctly. And it makes a whole lot more sense why you can't throw out bottle caps when you understand how the machines actually work and actually process the recycling. So yeah, I wanna go through a few of the do's and don'ts, but again, just a reminder um, that this is Christchurch edition. So I'll try and keep it simple. Um, oh, and for anyone in Christchurch as well, I have created like a, a cheat sheet um, that you can all supply after this and you can print it and put it, I don't know, wherever you want in your kitchen. I've done one for work and I've got it printed on the inside of the cupboard doors here. So if anyone needs a reminder about what recycling codes we use in Christchurch, they can just have a look and it's there at the point where they're actually figuring out what to do with their trash. So yeah, the first thing I wanted to highlight was that this symbol doesn't necessarily mean the thing is recyclable. Um, I thought that for quite a while and uh, yeah, it's a bit deceptive there. A little bit of green washing um, because there's all different types of recycling codes. You'll know from the bottom that it will have that symbol with like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the inside. Um, so yeah, you just do have to pay attention and, and just be savvy to that. Uh, okay, so these are just a few quick tips and I'm not going to dwell on this section too long because, yeah, it does differ from place to place. Um, but yeah, so the first one, ensure your recycling is clean and free from food waste. So that applies in Christchurch. So over here, we don't have water or such strict water restrictions as, as Australia. So they do encourage you to rinse milk bottles, rinse Coke bottles, that kind of thing with just a quick swish. It doesn't have to be perfectly scrubbed clean quick swish just to get out any of that food contaminants um same when it comes to something like a pizza box if you've got oil from your pizza on the pizza box you can't you can no longer recycle that 
you can compost it, um, but it's not clean paper. And so then when that goes through the recycling process, that contamination is going to spoil a whole lot of other stuff. So yeah, just making sure everything's clean before it goes in. Um, a lot of the things that go through, I learned at the recycling centre, people will put them in bags. So if they've had a party and people have done a good job of keeping their cans and their bottles and everything separated from the trash from the party, they'll put it in like a big garbage bag and then chuck it in the recycling bin. And that actually all gets pulled out in the contamination room and goes to landfill because they don't have time to be opening up those bags in this process of processing a whole city's worth of rubbish or recycling. Um, so make sure everything's loose and not in a bag. The next thing is removing, this is for Christchurch as well, is we have to remove all lids um, from bottles and containers. So if I throw out a plastic milk bottle at the office, I have to rinse the milk bottle, put the milk bottle, the clean milk bottle in the recycling bin, and then the lid has to go in the red, the red bin here, which is the landfill bin. And the reason for that is you can imagine when things are going through those um, screening processes and they're relying on all these discs and cogs and things like that, something small like a bottle cap when they're trying to get to sort um, something, it falls through the cracks and it will then end up contaminating um, other different types of recycled materials that have already been sorted. So in Christchurch, no bottle lids um, and no caps, no jar lids. All of that has to go straight into landfill or um, there are other recycling programs that you can find, but they just can't be put through the curbside recycling. That's important to note that even if you can't curbside, re curbside recycle it, you can hold on to things like that. And um, like aluminium, ring pools you can donate to certain charities because they can melt those down to become certain things or yeah the bottle caps um are kind of a niche thing that you could hold on to and recycle wine bottles but wine bottle lids you can hold on to those and find a place to recycle them um i don't have probably enough time tonight to go into the kind of things that they get turned into or where you can donate i know a place in christchurch so if you're interested to know i can let you know um, after this about where you can do it there but otherwise um might have to do your own Googling or chat to the council. Uh, yeah, point number four in Christchurch, only recycling codes one, two and five are accepted. So the rest, there's not enough demand um, to make it worthwhile for the council to be accepting those and um, processing them through their recycling centre. So unfortunately, anything else outside of those codes just has to go into your red landfill bin. Um, there is caveats when it comes to that stuff as well. I recently learned because I thought it was anything one, two and five that you could put in a recycling bin, but that's not the case. Actually, it has to, if you can crush it by hand, so if it's a soft plastic, um, it has to go to landfill as well, even if it's a one, two or five. And the reason for that is when it's going through the, the discs of the screening process, if it can accidentally, if it can be crushed and squeezed through one of those moving discs, then it's going to risk ending up in the wrong sorting pile. So anything that's soft um, or that you can crush with your hand, even if it's one, two or five, has to go in the landfill. Um, exciting news for some Cantabrians as well is that they've just brought back soft plastic recycling in some regions here. Um, I think all my Melbourne friends and my mum especially was always really shocked to hear that we couldn't do soft plastic recycling over here. Um, and it was taken away for a while because they just didn't, they couldn't deal with it under the New Zealand infrastructure, too small a country, but they've just brought it back. I don't, I don't know too much about it, but um, I was quite excited by that. <laughs> um, another one is horrible hybrids. So that's, that's kind of the, um, I suppose, industry name for them. And that's things that have multiple layers to them. They can't be recycled. So these are things like Tetra packs. Um, so a touch pack, what I mean by that is like if you get a, do you remember those juice poppers you used to get at school? Um, or uh, maybe where you buy your long life milk in or your soy milk or something. So those um, square containers, while they seem like they're cardboard, they're actually inside, they're like plastic, then foil, then cardboard, then plastic. So they're not actually be able to be recycled because of um, all the components. Uh, so they have to go to the landfill. Um, sorry, when I say go to landfill, I mean they can't be 
recycled um, in curbside recycling. There might be, I just haven't looked into it. All I know is they can't go in recycling. So unless you're going to go to a niche recycler or you're going to hold on to them or reuse them or do something, they have to go to landfill. So that's what I mean by that. Um, already touched on this kind of already, but small items can't be recycled in Christchurch either. So lids, um, I didn't know this, but anything smaller than an envelope when it comes to paper can't be recycled. And I think that's when it goes through the paper process, it goes over the discs and paper is lifted to the top to go over the top um, while everything else falls through. Whereas if it's not a big enough piece of card or paper, it's just going to fall through rather than going up over the top and then go and contaminate another type of recyclable material. So yeah, I think the golden rules that I've found are lids can't go in recycling, receipts can't go in recycling because they're too small, um, but also sometimes the way they're printed, they're actually not all paper. There's some little plasticky components in there. And also I think the rule that I found for other plastics are it's got to be bigger than a yogurt pottle. So the ones where you get your little individual yogurts in, if it's smaller than that, in terms of plastic, you can't put it in your curbside recycling bin. Oh, it's been a long slide. Um, so yeah, and lastly, no soft plastics, no matter the recycling code, you cannot. If you can crush it with your hand, you cannot. Cool, so I thought I'd just run through a few items um, to do a bit of a, a wee sampler slash pop quiz about where these should be put. So the first one, is plastic takeaway container. So providing that is clean, you can put that in your old curbside recycling bin in Christchurch. Whereas one of these brown, what you think is just paper takeaway containers, um, you have to be really careful with these. At first I was like, can I compost that? Well, can I recycle it? Actually, I'm one of those Karens now that emailed them, emailed the supplier and said, excuse me, what, what, what do I do with this? You're saying on your website that they're sustainable. In what way are they sustainable? And they're like, oh yeah, they are plastic lined. So you can't compost them, you can't recycle them. They do have to go in landfill. And I was like, ah, oh, very sustainable, great. Um, I think they are sustainable in the fact that they've been used from recyclable cardboard. But um, yeah, just another way you've got it. Just cause it's in brown packaging and might say eco, or have a little leaf on it doesn't mean that it can be recycled or composted. So we've got to be really careful for this stuff. So the trick that I use for this stuff is if it was you'd like to figure out whether it's got plastic lining is to think about whether it was repelling liquid. So if it was like a saucy curry and it's not soaking into that paper, it's likely that it's got a plastic film inside and therefore it's a hybrid. So it's a horrible hybrid um, with paper and plastic and it can't be recycled. Okay, I already talked about um, the soy milk tetra pack containers. They cannot be recycled by curbside because they've got too many layers. Uh, the old, the good old meat tray, that's a really challenging one as well because it, you have to look really carefully for numbers on these. Um, also a really, um, excuse the French, but a real shit house supplier and supermarket decided that they could find a cheaper way to manufacture these. So they brought something to the market at a supermarket that shall not be named. And it looks exactly the same as the actual recyclable meat trays, but it can't be recycled. Identical minus the little code. So you've got to look carefully for those, but with meat trays, you've got to, in Christchurch, you've got to give them a rinse. They don't want the meat juices going through the truck. Um, if it's been wrapped with like cling film, you have to remove all of that as well. That has to go um, either into, if it's clean, you could do it into the soft plastics recycling now, or otherwise, um, yeah, into landfill if it's too, too filthy. Uh, with something like clear plastic, like a pump bottle, um, if you remove the cap and remove the lid, you can put the bottle into the recycling bin curbside. The cap and the bottle, you can either recycle through a niche recycling program or pop it in landfill. And in Christchurch, you don't actually have to re remove the plastic wrap either. Other councils are different, but in Christchurch, they say you don't have to. If you've got the time, it's better, but otherwise it can go in as is. And the last one is a coffee cup. So that one is also a bit, bit of a catchy one because 
it does hold liquid. It doesn't soak into the paper, so it does have a plastic lining. A lot of people think you can recycle those and you just, you can't. Um, same with the lids on top, often they're not the right type of plastic to be recycled or they're too flimsy to get through the machines or too small. So you, that one, the lids ones, I'm not, I'm still not 100% sure what you can do with those. Um, but yeah, coffee cups, another one to look out for. So yeah, Christchurch people, I have done a cheat sheet. So I will send that out to you. Um, but otherwise for everybody else, some key takeaways. Um, make sure your recycling is clean and free from contamination. Do not put any rubbish or general waste in with your recycling. No pooey nappies. Always check with your local council about how you should prepare your recycling. If you're not sure or consult an app. So in Christchurch, there's a really good app called CCC Bins. I think it's called Christchurch City Council Bins. Um, if you can't find it, let me know. Um, I use it quite a bit. But yeah, you can scroll through um, all the different products. If you're not sure, you can also submit a question through the app as well and they get back to you. So I was like, strawberry punnets, they're kind of crushable if I had really strong hands but I don't know. And anyway, they got back to me in a couple of days and were like, confirm you can do strawberry punnets in Christchurch's recycling facilities. So yeah, there will be one for your own council in Australia. They're pretty good. A few of the girls from my climate group have already found some great resources. So if you're not, if you can't find, if you're not sure, feel free to ask me and I'm quite happy to spend an evening Googling because <laughs> that's my life now. Um, and yeah, biggest one, if you're in doubt, just leave it out. We don't need any more contamination going in to the recycling. Not cool. And then if you're super keen bean, here's some extra ways you can go like one step further. Um, the open day at Christchurch was just pretty eye-opening for me. So I would really encourage you to go to an open day in your local council area if you get the opportunity. So I think I found out about that because I was following the Christchurch City Council Facebook page and they posted it as a Facebook event. So perhaps that's something you want to do um, or otherwise you could probably email them. I suspect they're quite frequent actually, maybe in a non-COVID world, but um, talk about recycling. <laughs> I know that sounds really lame, but it's, yeah, the more we talk about it, the more people are going to be re-educated. I feel like a little bit of a pest in the office sometimes being like, Oh, hey, can we get the clear milk bottles, not the, the white ones and explaining why, or, you know, I saw the people were popping the milk bottles in with the lids on and I had to see, you know, I sent one of those names, hey, everyone, smiley face. But um, yeah, we got to, we got to do it. <laughs> Have those hard conversations and find ways not to be total pests while doing it. Um, another great tip that I got last night from my climate gals was to ask your council what they're up to. What are they doing to stop contamination happening in your local area or in their district? Um, how are they educating the community about correct recycling practices? And what are the barriers they're facing? That was a really interesting one that I asked the recycling day uh, that, yeah, some stuff came out of there. Like, didn't think that goat carcasses would be a problem, but there you go. The things you learn when you ask. Um, and then I've, Lastly, on this section, I wanted to have a humble brag about Christchurch's efforts. I think they do a really good job of trying to educate people. Of course, it will never be enough because there's always going to be loonies out there who are doing the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, they have recently started doing, uh, well, I don't know if it's recent actually. I've only just learned about it. <laughs> um, they do audits of the bins every now and then in different councils and uh, or different areas, sorry. And if you've been good, they give you a Thanks for bin great sticker, which I think is really cool. And then anyone who's not doing the right thing, they'll put like a red tag on there and give them a couple of opportunities to remedy the issues. Uh, and then after that, they confiscate their bin. <laughs> and you have to pay to get back. So I feel like that's good. <laughs> and they do letterbox drops as well of like, have you been good? And yeah, a list of everything. Also, a lot of the bins have stickers on the inside saying what you can and what you can't. They're not super comprehensive, but it's a good start as well. And I love that Christchurch is also, um, they use their actual bin trucks for advertising as well. So about uh, downloading the wheelie bin app or um, yeah, they did one because I think they must've got a lot of pizza boxes, like contaminated pizza boxes. And they did one saying pizza box, like red bin and just visually spelled it out. It's quite a good advertising space. Okay, so I'm gonna push on and I just wanted to talk about the fact 
that recycling isn't the be all and end all um, to pollution solutions and uh, the rest. So before I push into that, I just wanted to drive home. This is one of the biggest things I learned from watching that documentary called The Story of Plastic was when you're throwing something out, you're not actually just throwing out the product itself. So an example I gave to my gals was, um, sorry, my climate gals was, for example, like take a banana. I know that's moving out of the recycling space, but take a banana and it's got a bit mushy. Maybe you left it in your bag and it's got a bit brown, it got a bit squishy. No one really likes a squishy banana. But there's other uses for that banana. You can make banana bread, you can chuck it in the smoothie, it can still be happy days. Because if you throw that out, you're throwing out all of the resources that went into creating that banana. So for a lot of the bananas here, they're actually, um, they're grown and farmed in, I think, I might get it wrong, Story, country starting with E. I'm pretty sure it's Ecuador. No, that's not right. Anyway, South America somewhere. And so that banana has to be grown. It, you have to put, probably put fertilizer on the plants, uh, on, the, on the crops. You would have to use pesticides. And yeah, there's a lot of water that goes into treating or uh, to growing them. Then some poor, probably underpaid, underprivileged farmer has to pick the banana. It's got to be then probably washed um, it's got to go through screens for cosmetic standards. It's got to be put on um, in a pallet in a truck that's then got to be either shipped or flown over, I think shipped, to New Zealand. There it's got to be transported from the airport to the depot, the depot to the supermarket. At the supermarket, some produce man has got a or woman has got to pull it out of its pallet to put it on the shelf for then to you to come in and be like, mm, that one's a bit bruised, ma or to buy it, to take it home, to leave it, for it to go black, for it to get thrown in the compost to then rot. And you just think about all of the resources that went into producing that. Um, and I like to think about any recycling material in the same way. So if you think about, actually, I don't have a good enough example, but in anyway, in any kind of process, there's always going to be water use. There's going to be just so random, but lubrication for the machine. There's got to be manpower, some poor person working some shitty job when they could probably be reallocated into a, a, a job with better conditions. And there's going to be air pollution, water pollution, transport resources, and all the emissions that go with that. And warehouse storage for, say, a bottle of water that you're going to use for a couple of minutes or a coffee cup that you're going to use for a couple of minutes before it goes into the trash. And I think we really, really need to start thinking about the fact that recycling isn't the pollution solution. It's uh, the solution is stopping plastic production in the first place. And so um, I, this is a new-ish kind of concept to me, but around a circular economy. So um, we really need to be moving away from something like a circular economy where resources to a place where resources are actually valued and where systems and products are designed to keep products and goods in circulation rather than going through a process like this where we've got engineered redundancy, where it's not a linear process where it goes through the production, it gets used and then it gets disposed of, or you can't see my cursor, I don't think, but where it goes right back to the very start of the process through that remanufacturing or refurbishing loop to then get repurposed from those pellets back into something else. If we can shorten that loop and reuse things, um, that's really where we can make a difference. And what I've learned from doing a lot of research recently is that consumers do hold the power a lot of the time. As an individual, you don't really think you can do very much. But if we stop buying it, they'll stop producing it. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind from my point of view. Um, and I just wanted to bring up, uh, I know there's like all variations of the three R's and the five R's and the seven R's, but this is just one I chose because it looks pretty. Um, so the five R's, um, you'll see that recycling is second from the bottom here. So recycling is, well, great to do and you've got to do it well. It's one of, in my mind, it's one of the last resorts. And it's really hard to do that these days, like so hard because <laughs> everything is packaged or everything is, I don't know, 
our lives have become so convenient that moving away from that convenience is really hard. Um, but yeah, starting from the top, some of the ways that I try to reduce the amount of stuff that I'm sending to recycle, like through the recycling and popping in the curbside recycling bin is that I've been trying to refuse things. So say no to freebies. You've got no idea how many freebies we get offered in life. And you want this pamphlet? And usually I'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. I'm a people pleaser, sure. I'll say yes. Or do you want um, cutlery with your takeaway? Um, do you want this free drink on the airplane? Do you want a, do you want a coffee on the airplane? Do you want a free cookie on the airplane? And all the trash that's kind of associated with that. If you just refuse in the first place, that's a that's a really good step for just shutting that down. Um, reducing, so this could either be swapping to alternatives. So for like at the moment, I used to go into the supermarket and I'd just buy whatever lettuce. And now I look at all the different lettuces and say, is this lettai? Um <laughs> Sally? I don't know. Who knows? Um, so instead of choosing the bagged lettuce, I'll always go for the nudie lettuce now. Same with my cucumbers. No more of those um, Telegraph guys that are always wrapped. I'll go for the Lebanese ones now because they're, they're nude, more nude food. Um, and the other things that we can choose is, yeah, different types of materials. So what I've done recently, and this is just like, my laugh guys so don't laugh but um something like sour cream when i'm looking at sour cream in the supermarket because i'm failing at veganism um, and i love my sour cream um is that all the puddles um sorry that's a real kiwi word all the containers of sour cream um have uh i think they're recycling code three or something anyway they're one that you can't recycle here in Christchurch which is just annoying so then I look at all the different alternatives and in Christchurch they actually do a sour cream that's in a pouch and so I'm like oh what's actually producing less plastic if this has to go to some form of landfill anyway would I rather send an actual container with a lid or would I really rather send like a thin film pouch and that I don't, still don't really know the right answers but um I've been going for something like the pouch. So instead of, yeah, it's not refusing because I still want my sour cream and I haven't learned to make it myself yet out of cashews, <laughs> um, but reducing is sometimes in the alternatives that you choose, similar to changing, changing from the clear milk bottle to the, the white milk, uh, sorry, from the white to the clear, um, just making those choices. Um, same, I've, I've learned recently that metal is pretty much infinitely recyclable that it doesn't lose its structure when it goes through the recycling process. So from that, I've learned to, instead of say, cause I was like, oh, glass is really recyclable and maybe I'll get stuff in glass, but glass is quite involved to actually produce and to, to shape and then to recycle. So instead of choosing something like crushed tomatoes in a glass jar, I'm choosing a metal can because that's, yeah, the man at the recycling center said that that's a way more desirable product and yeah, it's, it's got a much longer lifespan when it comes to recycling. Okay, and then reuse. Um, I have a demonstration. So, I mean, everyone's pretty good at this stuff, but instead of buying a pump bottle, bring your reusable container. Yeah, Sally, yeah. You can get stuff everywhere. Bring your keep cup. <laughs> Once you're in the habit of it, yeah, everybody. <laughs> Once you've got your keep cup, um, you're sorted. And I, I love my keep cup. It's like thermal and it keeps my drink hot for ages. So invest in a good one. And then, yeah, all it takes is just a bit of a rinse after you've finished it. Plug Frank Green, everyone. Sally works for Frank Green. <laughs> um, I have a, a spork spoon, spoon, spork, fork, spoon, knife um, that comes in my backpack everywhere with me so I can refuse plastic cutlery when I'm out. Um, similarly, my car and my backpack always seem to be filled with plastic containers. So when I go to get takeaway, I say, hey, can I bring my container? And they say, yes, rock up five minutes early. I'm like, okay, okay. And I come down and sometimes they give you bigger portions. Um, so that's also, a, that's a win. Um, and then other things, if you're real, like if you're real keen and I know this isn't possible, but I'm, you know, I'm like, well, I'm not single, but I'm, you know, I don't have kids. I'm not like rooted down. So I have time to make my own hummus. 
Um, <laughs> not everybody has the time to do that. But yeah, this the hummus containers have to go to recycling. Whereas now I buy a can of chickpeas or I get raw chickpeas from the bulk bin scoopy place and make my own hummus through there. So they're just some ways that you can reuse. And then after all of that, choose to recycle. Okay, but be easy on yourself, go easy. It's, it's tough out there guys. And you can't do everything at once, like it is challenging. Um, so I'm just aiming to choose like one different thing at a time. So going into the supermarket and trying to rethink your whole shop is really daunting, but you know, I'll just go in and I'll be like sour cream. Mm sour cream and like think about it for an extra 30 seconds make a better choice and now when I go to the supermarket I know exactly which sour cream I'm getting and it's like yeah it's switched so maybe choose a couple of things um even if it is just adding to your list phone keys wallet keep cup you know just one thing at a time thin <laughs> thanks everybody I'm really like hot and flustered. <laughs> um, yay, cool. All right, let me have a scroll through the chat. Oh, Ecuador, thank you, Sean. Thanks, Jesse. Yay, no worries. <laughs> so good. Cool. You answered one of my questions already, but can I ask the other one? Yes, very good. I'm going to close that off so I can look at faces. Um, when you said that the trucks get can like 40 percent of the trucks get contaminated and have to go to landfill mm. is that just like one item causes the contamination or does it have to be like a certain amount of it in there that causes the whole thing to go i'm not 100 percent sure i think it probably depends on the nature of the contaminant mm -hmm. um and it how far it's spread really through everything i think yeah. one of your slides said on average 15 percent yeah maybe that's the threshold then I feel like it should be lower than that. I know that when it comes to actually bailing up the recycling, that when a broker comes to look at those, they won't accept anything more than 1% um, contamination. Right. But I think with the trucks, I imagine, because it just all gets tipped onto the floor, they probably just go like, mm, and have a look. And then it goes through. And probably if there's something obvious like poop or um, yeah, motor oil or something like that, that oh hello poop machine <laughs> you'll be pleased to know he's wearing no nappy at all right now oh great Love. good man <laughs> um yeah so l i don't know exactly but um yeah as long as I'll possible call hopefully yeah yeah call the council um let me see what other questions I don't think there's a way we can make it easier for the poor people recycling things by hand, apart from just talking to other people in the community and um, yeah, getting education out there. So yeah, the best way I've found of doing that so far is just talking, <laughs> telling people what you can do and what you can't do and maybe chatting to the council to see what they think you could do as well. But um, yeah, just put your carcasses elsewhere. Um, feel free to jump in with any verbal questions. I'm just reading through the chat. And yes, Zhezh, I totally agree that there needs to be absolutely more regulation around the use of the words eco, biodegradable, de degradable, compostable. There's so much greenwashing out there and I almost want to do a whole webinar on itself just on greenwashing because it makes me so mad. I think... Um, <laughs> It's killing me at the moment. I'm, um, for those who don't know, I'm having a baby next week and the eco wash or the greenwashing from the eco-friendly nappies is the worst because people are just putting them then in either compost or recycling, but they have to go to landfill anyway. Mm. It's, uh, it's so misleading. I think yeah. Stop. My yeah. Hate. <laughs> no, it is Quick. out of control. I think I've told a few of you, I've had like this, I report, <laughs> this is again my, my raging social life. Um, I have recently um, decided to pick on a water balloon company <laughs> um, and I reported them to the, what are they called again? Advertising Authority, something authority. There's an acronym. I think it's ACA or something like that. Anyway, the Advertising Authority. And um, yeah, they, I wrote to them and said, as per 
advertising standard code such and such, you can't claim that these are environmentally friendly. They're water balloons. There's bits of balloon going all through the waterways. Like, I don't know how this could be possible. And I reported it and they're taking it to their board, which is really exciting. So I think given there's no regulation, there are ways that we can um, get in first and be proactive in this, in yeah, catching people out and reporting them. I know it does take time and um, yeah, people do have busier lives than me <laughs> where I can afford the time to do kind of stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. And things are moving in the right direction. They're just moving too slowly, I reckon. What else have we got? <laughs> yeah, just the reason uh, the, um, the ads here can be pretty creative. I love that they can, it's like Kiwis just don't take themselves too seriously and there's a lot of quirk thrown into those ads. Um, and New Zealand should totally take it on, but they need to fix themselves first. <laughs> I don't think they're in a position to um, be talking about social environmental responsibility with some of the stuff that goes on. But at the same time, they're a really reputable brand and if they want to get involved, I probably wouldn't say no either. Um, Cool. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I'm kind of, if nothing's popping to mind now, I am available and love um, talking trash whenever. So um, yeah, absolutely encourage you to message me with any questions if you want. But if there's nothing else. Thanks. Very informative. City of Brook. City. Yes, hello, you and Lawn. The lady in the front with the blue jacket. Oh, in the cold, in the rain, camping. Um, yeah. City of Burundara have got a really good website um, and they'll have a guest speaker come out any time to speak to you about their recycling. Um, they've got an A to Z of recycling and waste um, mm. and they really put you in touch with you know, things like where do you recycle plastic bottles, you know, that um, would normally go into your recycle bin, razor blades, just a whole range of stuff. So, um, but they're really good in sending people out. I've had them come and talk to our group and answer all sorts of questions. But their focus, again, like your five R's, is about instead of uh, refuse, they have a void. Um, so mm. Wayne was just saying it's like ah, because it's. <laughs> um, but there's got all the same things. <laughs> mm. So. Um, yeah, but they'll come out and they'll talk to any group about what you can do. So, and, and obviously listening to what there's different things that you can and can't do mm. from New Zealand and, and Australia. So it's, I think it's really good to get it from a local council perspective of what you can put in your bins and what you can't, but mm. also what recycling facilities are available across Melbourne for those of you who are in Melbourne, because there's so much stuff and We've got a repair cafe, so any electricals you can go and learn how to repair it. There's one mm -hmm. in Baldwin. Um, so if your toaster's broken, you can go over there and get a lesson how to fix your toaster rather than throw it out. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good concept as well. So Yeah, I think um, with that stuff, like repairing things is is a really great thing to focus on. Um, but I'm finding it's, you know, it's so much easier to go and get an, another $30 toaster from the warehouse or from Kmart and mm. prices of things are just making it, it's like time versus money. And mm. like most people will be like, I don't have time to go down to ball and to wait for the man to fix my toaster to then pick up my toaster again. I'll just buy one for $30, $50. So are yeah, you, it is a really big attitude change. Yeah, all that. Um, but one thing that I kind of switched my thinking recently that, um, you know, when I'm always like, no, oh, I don't have time to go to the place where I drop my bottle lids off that specific place, or I don't have time to do this. Whereas I, want, I started kind of thinking about it as instead of thinking you don't have time for it um, or that things take so much time that once upon a time, or like in the old days, this is how things worked. You didn't just go out and get something new. You you repaired it or with your milk bottles, you left your milk bottle out for someone to come and collect and then to refill again. And this isn't some like new way of living. Like this is going back to a really old way of living of just conserving and repairing um, and reusing and doing hand-me-downs and all the rest. So mm. big attitude changes that um, need to happen. So, yeah. 
Okay. Just quick plug for Recycle Smart app in Melbourne. You can put in your address oh, yeah. and it automatically tells oh. you. Cheers, Shay. It's, it's so good. Catch you soon. Yeah. You can look up things. So you can click into like glass. This You can't see it, but it tells you like all the different kinds of glass. And if it says no, it? it's called Recycle Smart. And it'll leave- you see, are you setting something up that we can share this sort of stuff? Like if we come across a website that we can actually pop it on for people to check out? Well, then we'll add it to the climates list of things to tackle. Okay. <laughs> look, Sally, can you please take minutes of that? <laughs> Woolworths is doing loop um, and uh, TerraCycle. So. Mm. It's like they're picking that up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I think it'd be good to put stuff on. It'd be great. We'll work on it. You'll be the first to know. Cool. Do you take All over right. 60s? Well, you could be a celebrity speaker, maybe. Every second Wednesday. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Three minutes over time. I'm quite hungry. Don't know about you guys. <laughs> Um, I'm going to leave it there, but thank you, nearest and dearest, for coming to join me. Um, I hope it was informative and not too rambly, not too confusing. I will be asking for feedback, please, honest feedback. Um, uh, but yeah, let's let's do this thing. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for your time, and I'm going to save the recording. So if you have anybody who you think might want to see it. I'll be sending a link around in the next little while. And yeah, if you have any questions, just um, okay. let me know. Cool. Easy. Thanks, Jessie. Well done. Have a great Bye. evening. Russell family. <laughs> Thanks, Jessie. Good to see you gorgeous girls. <laughs> see you guys. Bye, Russell family. Bye. See ya. Bye, Donzie. Bye, guys.